So hello everyone and thank you for joining in today for our Center for Mindfulness Science keynote with Dr. Nicholas Van Dam. Um, welcome Dr. Van Dam today from Australia where he's living in our future. <laughs> it's around 11 o'clock on Thursday over there. And he'll be giving a talk for us today on scaling meditation, maximizing benefits and minimizing harms. Dr. Van Dam is an associate professor and the inaugural director of the Contemplative Study Center in the University of, in the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences at the University of Melbourne. And he's a highly regarded global leader in contemplative research and practice, having published many important contributions to the field of mindfulness science, including work assessing the difficulties in obtaining reliable measures of mindfulness, the relationship between mindfulness and other psychometric uh, uh, qualities that may be even more importantly targeted through contemplative practice, like self-compassion, um, the neural correlates of mindfulness practice, and a fairly high impact paper that really made a splash for our field a few years ago called Mind the Hype. Uh, he was the lead author on that paper. Some of you I'm sure have read it. As the director of uh, the funded Contemplative Studies Center, um, he's got his hands in a number of different uh, projects at the psychological and neurophysiological level at this point. And it's really uh, a pleasure to be able to host you here today with our center at USC. Um, Dr. Van Dam completed a Bachelor of Science in Neurobiology and Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, followed by a Master's and PhD in Clinical Psychology at the University of Albany in New York. Upon completing his PhD, he also undertook postdoctoral fellowships in psychiatry, clinical neuroscience, and psychiatric neuroimaging prior to starting his faculty appointment at the University of Melbourne. And again, uh, we really appreciate your expertise and uh, willingness to come speak with us today. As usual for this talk, um, uh, we'll have a question and answer period uh, towards the end for the next hour or so. Um, plus or minus, depending on uh, how things go and questions. Uh, Dr. Van Dam will give, be giving his uh, talk and then we'll transition to the question answer period. Over the course of the talk, if there are really qu clarifying questions that people have, feel free to use the chat or um, Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And I'll keep an eye there and kind of pose questions uh, in the midst of the talk if there are things that um, really, people have questions just to clarify what's being said in the course of, this, of the talk. If there are more kind of integrative uh, involved questions, uh, let's plan to leave those for the end when we can really get into some question and answer together. So without further ado, thank you again for being here with us today. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can take on over Nicholas. Great. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, present, and it's it's great to present to uh, an audience, in fact, in the States. Um, I moved to Melbourne about four and a half years ago, um, and I haven't been back to the States. I think 2018 might have been the last time I was able to get back, given all the chaos that's happened in recent times. So uh, it's fun to be presenting again to what, what looks like uh, an American audience. I see some, uh, some people from elsewhere in the world as well, so that's great. Um, just share my screen. Bear with me one second. That, I'm sure that was uh, on people's Zoom bingo. Um, if you're playing along at home, um, so uh, just just by way of a, a bit of introduction here, um, if if you do want to get in touch with me, if you have questions that I didn't answer today, um, please do contact me. I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, my email is here on the bottom. Um, you can also tweet at me or um, at, at my Twitter handle here. And then if you want to check out our center at the University of Melbourne, the Contemplative Study Center, uh, here is the website for that. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about scaling meditation um, and, and a number of ways in which meditation has kind of become popular and how that works. Um, uh, someone said I've picked up an Aussie accent. Okay. Um, interesting. I um, noticed the same. <laughs> I thought I, I thought I changed... Uh, Change the way I may have said some things, but uh, it's interesting. Um, 
All right. Uh, well, just a quick disclosure. Um, so, uh, of course, I am the recipient of an incredibly generous philanthropic gift, and so that was given to me by the Three Springs Foundation. Um, and that the, the director of that um, foundation is Mr. Martin Hosking, um, the former CEO of a company called Redbubble. Um, and it was that donation that allowed us to establish the Contemplative Study Center um, here at the University of Melbourne, and I'm, of course, the director of that. So. Um, I thought it should. It's appropriate that I tell you that ahead of time. Uh, I'm not necessarily promoting Martin or Redbubble or anything to do with that. And um, our center um, doesn't isn't a commercial venture, but um, nonetheless, you should know. Um, so um, I thought it would be appropriate sort of to start off by talking about the fact that mindfulness is absolutely everywhere. Um, you know, it, it's in corporations, um, it's in schools, it's being used in the military. Um, and just before I left New York City, uh, these aren't pictures that I took, but um, for some that may have spent some time recently in New York City, um, I was being inundated by ads in particular from Headspace um, as I left the subway system. So it's just kind of come something that sort of is permeating our lives and it's being applied to um, just about everything and anything. Um, and so it, it raises some real questions, I think, about um, well, what is it, what does it do, what can it work for, what can't it work for. Um, in the context of the pandemic, um, one thing that sort of particularly stuck out for me was the, the app company Headspace had made their um, their program of freely available to people who had recently lost their jobs. I, I think that might have been 2020. Um, and it raised some interesting questions for me around sort of like, is that really what people who just lost their jobs want and need um, access to a meditation app? And so I think there's a lot of interesting questions um, and some of the pervasiveness of mindfulness and meditation um, have also, I think, resulted in or led to or contributed to kind of a bit of pushback um, and or a bit of a knee jerk response to people kind of saying, I'm not interested. I want nothing to do with that. I'm sick of hearing about it. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, so what's going on? Like, what is the interest? How, how big is the interest? Um, I often like to show a couple of different trends sort of just to give you a sense of how um, how much the interest in mindfulness is actually growing. So the top here is a Google Trends um, graph, and, and this is sort of just all searches worldwide for these two terms. So in red, you can see psychotherapy, and in blue, you can see mindfulness. And so it's quite interesting to note that, um, and, and you know, I often play with the terms that I use in these things for different presentations around the world. When I present in Germany, I use things like Angela Merkel. Um, in Australia, I'll often use the prime minister here. But uh, I was actually quite surprised this time. I thought, oh, maybe I'll use something that's a little more um, traditional science or psychological and I use psychotherapy and I was quite actually surprised to see that mindfulness has sort of well surpassed um, psychotherapy search terms. Um, so, so you get a sense sort of of mindfulness is, is sort of something that people are really searching for, you know, since what, I guess, 20, I don't know, 2012 or something like that. People are searching more for mindfulness than they are for psychotherapy. So that, that tells you something. Uh, another interesting point, and, you know, look, I know with these kinds of graphs, and I had responses from the Mind the Hype paper, so what you're looking at here, um, sorry, I'll, I'll finish that, that, that thought in a second. Um, what you're looking at here is the percentage of the academic or sort of um, number of publications, so the percent of the corpus that was produced in any given year within two areas. So in the kind of teal blue color, you've got mindfulness or meditation. And in the, um, the, the darker blue, you've got gravity. Um, so one of the things, so we published graphs in the past that are showing you know, the, the kind of exponential rise in, in academic publications on mindfulness and meditation. And many people sort of argue, rightfully so, that, well, I mean, look, there's the reality sort of is just that publications have been going up across the academy. So we're just seeing a lot more publications in general. And so I think it is worthwhile sort of exploring this in particular and sort of looking, and you can see in this figure here, something that is a bit more established, um, a little bit more established, gravity, um, relative to mindfulness and meditation, and when we kind of have learned about that or how the academic, what percentage of the academic corpus sort of was produced at a certain time. And you can see that gravity is sort of reasonably well distributed um, over time. So this is just going back to 1950. Uh, you do see that trend I talked about of just overall a lot more publication, but it's worth noting that more than 93% of all academic works on mindfulness and meditation have been published in the past two decades. And that's compared to 73% for, for gravity. So there is a trend, and I mean, this is just sort of reflecting the fact that mindfulness and meditation are relatively new disciplines in terms of you know, um, us studying it scientifically. Um, so there's a lot going on. We're learning a lot really quickly, um, but also people are really interested in this area. And so, you know, that, that creates particular um, pluses and it also particular, creates particular sort of downsides or cons. Um, so 
I'm assuming everyone probably knows, but so what is mindfulness actually? This is something I spend a lot of time thinking about, a lot of time talking about. Um, most people are very familiar with, with this definition by John Kabat-Zinn, so, um, but I'll, I'll repeat it just for the sake of sort of clarification. Um, so this is sort of one particular definition that is used, or one variation on the, on the most commonly used definition. So John Kabat-Zinn defines mindfulness as awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So most people will be familiar with that definition and with that idea. Um, you know, it's that main attention awareness kind of thing, and then there's this three attitudinal qualities of on purpose, present momentness, or sort of being in the present, and that aspect of non-judgment. Uh, and so that kind of was the main definition that John was putting out there um, when he really first make, made this popular and sort of in, in later iterations. What I often like to point out, though, is that when John in um, 2011 wrote a commentary in contemporary Buddhism, he elaborated a little bit on that. And one of the things that he said was, giving the history of the development of mindfulness-based stress reduction, is that the word mindfulness was used intentionally as an umbrella term. Um, and it was used in certain contexts as a placeholder for the entire dharma, meant to carry multiple meanings and traditions simultaneously. And so I think this is quite um, interesting and also um, elucidating in the sense that while he clearly sort of meant something about attention and these sort of attitudinal qualities that go along with it, he really also at the same time was sort of using it as this placeholder. And it was meant to carry a lot more than just attention and awareness. Um, or just these three attitudes. So he really was thinking of MBSR as something that could promote the entirety of the Dharma, the, the sort of whole of all of the Buddhist teachings. Um, and so that that's that's quite interesting and, and quite thought provoking when you really think about it, that the single term was meant to carry all of these ideas. So it explains why there's so much confusion as to what mindfulness is. Um, so I often also like to increasingly talk about, well, what is Buddhist mindfulness? And the reason that I like to talk about this is because this is where the particular idea of mindfulness, at least the way that we often talk about it, comes from. And I feel like it's quite important for people to know when we talk about mindfulness, at least in you know, sati, in the Buddhist context, that the, the, the way that Kabat-Zinn sort of frames it and the way that we often think about it in academia or in scientific studies is different. There, there's a lot more to it. Uh, and this is kind of, these are kind of the teachings that um, that Kabat-Zinn was talking to in terms of that, that entirety of the Dharma or the teachings. So, you know, what, what, are the, what, is the, what are the basic principles of Buddhism, you know, in, in a really sort of colloquial sense? So firstly, you know, we've got, and I'm really using sort of um, Stephen Batchelor's contemporary interpretation of, of Buddhist ideas here. So that the two basic tenets, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I mean, that's sort of the, the fundamental core idea. Um, so, you know, we're going to experience pain no matter what we do. That's just part of life. But suffering, kind of how we interpret it or how we um, relate to the pain, is something that we actually do have a bit of control over. The task, then, um, that we, it's put to us, put to us by the Buddha and, and many various Buddhist teachers, uh, as well as many other meditation teachers, is a way of actually addressing those kind of two insights. And Stephen Batcher sort of uh, uh, interprets these things as initially embrace life. So accept that, you know, you can't get rid of bad things. Um, just embrace it. Embrace it all. The good comes along with the bad. Let go of things that arise. So you can't hold on to them forever. Um, good things come, good things go. Bad things come, bad things go. So the, the task is just to embrace it all and kind of let go of it as it goes because there's not a lot we can do about it going. Um, and then you're going to, as you're letting go of things, you can see it letting go. You can see how things won't perpetuate forever and how you, if you don't elaborate on things in your mind, you, you start to actually be able to um, stop spinning your wheels, so to speak, mentally or physically um, in real time. And then finally, and I really like the way that Stephen Batcher talks about this, there he translates this last part of, of the fourfold task um, which, which is what his translation of the Fourfold Noble Truths, um, to act, like there's something you actually have to do. There's an imperative there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation, but also sort of a go out there and actually do something in the world. And that's where we get the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, and really, this is important because mindfulness sits down here in, as one element of a much broader set of ideas. So it's just one part of the kind of set of principles or philosophies by which we're encouraged to live our life. Um, now, I'm not saying you need to become Buddhist. I'm not saying that Buddhism is the only way to understand or think about the world. There's lots of other wonderful ideas out there. Um, I'm not a Buddhist per se, although I like Buddhist ideas. Um, but it is important to know that this is where this term mindfulness originally comes from. So when we talk about mindfulness in this context, 
It's situated within this sweep of kind of life philosophies, and they entail wisdom, which is sort of, you know, having appropriate view of the world, or, or Stephen Batchelor has translated this rather than right to complete view. You really can see things as they are. Um, complete thought or intention, you, you kind of are aware of and have good thinking, or you know what you're trying to do in the world. There's this important element of ethics, ethical conduct, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you earn your living, that that's really important to the way that you live your life. And then finally, there's this element of mental development, and this is typically translated into meditation. And it's within this context that we're typically talking about something like mindfulness. Um, so that's where this idea of samadhi comes in, meditation comes in. All right, so enough Buddhism. Um, what is mindfulness, though? And I think this is something that I get asked a lot, and this is something that um, comes up a lot in these discussions. And certainly in the way that we think about measuring it, some people will suggest, well, it's a state, it's a trait, it's a process, it's all three, it's some combination of these things. Um, and I think just going back or using an example that I like to use, um, think about the sniper. Um, I think this is a really useful way of thinking about it, in particular because if we just talk about mindfulness as a particular capacity or quality of training attention, or a particular capacity or quality of attention and awareness, the sniper is the best example that I can think of readily. In the sense that the sniper is incredibly aware of everything around them, the, the, the rifle is an extension of their body. They know exactly what's going to happen as that bullet traverses through the air. You know, they're, they're breathing in and out with all of the sensations and everything that's happening. Um, so they're very aware of a lot of different factors, and they have a clear intention and goal. And that's where this is a really interesting example, because the goal is to ultimately take someone's life. And so arguably, you could say the person is really mindful, um, they have all the qualities that we typically think of as, as mindfulness or being mindful, but does it fit with kind of the ethical sense of, well, what are you meant to do, right? I mean, we often think in the Buddhist context, the ultimate goal is to not do any harm. And so clearly kind of the act of killing someone in this way doesn't really seem to fit within this framework. And so I think it's important to consider, is that, is that ethical component important? Um, can we train people to sort of use mindfulness to any means? Does it matter whether there's an ethical component? Um, or, um, you know, yeah, I guess how, how do we think about that? And my, my position is that ethics does matter. Um, that ultimately sort of training someone to have these skill sets without sort of talking about to what means are they going to put it is potentially inconsistent with how traditionally most people have thought of this practice. Similarly, I would argue that ultimately mindfulness is a process. So the, the term sati, um, as it's historically defined or interpreted, there, there is some suggestion of an element of memory, um, of retention, of recalling a particular intention to act in a particular way. So along the lines of minding your head or minding the gap, you're remembering to engage with the world in a particular way. Um, and while it may lead to particular states, or m there may be particular traits that make it easier for one to be mindful, um, I've made the argument in various other places that I do not think that these measures necessarily reflect the same thing as what we do when we're practicing mindfulness, either formally or informally. Um, now, who is meditating? And I'm happy to talk more about conceptions, definitions, etc. cetera, um, but I want to go into this, so some more interesting meaty stuff around who is meditating. Um, we don't have a lot of data about this yet. Um, one might think or wish we had more. I certainly wish we had more data, um, but there, to my knowledge and my ability, I haven't been able to find much out there. Um, luckily, the CDC has done some surveys. So one thing we do know, particularly in the U.S., is that about 14.2% of U.S. adults engaged in meditation as of 2017. And we also know, because they asked some questions back in 2012, um, that about 4.1% were meditating at that point. So you can see there has been a huge increase in interest in meditation between the years of 2012 and 2017. And if downloads of apps, uptake of books, you know, um, use of you know, programs, seminars, etc., suggest anything, we know that that trend has probably increased. Um, so who are these individuals? Who are the adults that are more likely to meditate? So there are some analyses out there that have given us some insights into this. There's a paper um, from Kramer here from Scientific Reports. This was analyzing that 2012 data. So there may have been shifts and changes in who is meditating you know, in, in the, the time since 2012. It's a decade ago. But what we did know at that point was that on, on the whole, and, and this is quite a large sample of data that we were talking about, that the people that were most likely to be meditating tended to be people in their 30s or um, 
slightly later in their life, 50s and 60s. Um, they tended to be female, um, so women are much more likely to be meditating um, than men. Um, on average, we're talking mostly about non-Hispanic white people are the ones that are engaging with this. In general, um, it's people that tend to be more educated. Um, and in general, it's people sort of that are already engaging in some level of moderate exercise and a number of other pro-health behaviors. The same paper talks about some really interesting data that I won't go into around people that actually also have chronic health issues um, are trying to quit smoking and a number of other things are also more likely to, to use meditation. So I haven't looked at the data personally, um, but I suspect there might be a bit of a split there with people that are already quite healthy and sort of just looking to further improve themselves um, that are using meditation. And also these people that actually are trying to use meditation to address particular problems or sets of problems. Uh, but that's something I think that, that warrants some more exploration. So why do people actually begin meditation? What do we know about this? Again, not as much as I think we would like to. Um, there's been some really interesting work by Peter Settlemeyer um, with, with colleagues and with, with students. Um, I found this to be particularly interesting. So he did a study with about around 250 participants. Um, now, most of these people actually did have more than a year of experience meditating. So there could be retrospective bias. You know, They may have been recalling the reasons they did it quite favorably or in a certain way. All of that is worth thinking about. Um, they, found, they identified um, reasons why people started and why they continued meditating. And these, what I'm showing you here, are things that were only really relevant for beginning. They weren't necessarily relevant for continuing. What I find really interesting about this is that the most relevant factor here is curiosity. Um, so the main reason why people begin meditating, at least in this survey, is just because they're curious. Um, when you look at sort of other factors, things that you might think might really matter, recommended by doctor or therapist, that actually doesn't seem to really make much of a difference at all. Um, you know, recommended by friends or acquaintance, not really all that much of a difference. Um, some people are sort of getting interested in meditation via yoga, but you know, the magnitude of the effect there is nowhere near the same as curiosity. Um, but you know, there is some sort of social contagion as well, right? So people kind of reading about it online are, are getting somewhat enthusiastic and wanting to try. But that curiosity thing is the thing that really gets me. Um, so they did, they've done a lot more, and look, it, it, it will be no surprise to anybody sort of who's in this area that at the end of the day, sort of what kind of most people, the things that explain the most variance were personal development to kind of feel more calm or feel better, or things like contentment and clarity, things that sort of explain the lesser variance, but were also important to people were things like dealing with problems, um, connecting with nature, improving themselves, things like liberation or compassion, which you know, might fit more with the Buddhist idea or seeking spiritual experiences or insight. But at the end of the day, um, the thing that kind of explains the most various overall is the stuff that we would probably most associate with why people are meditating. That kind of general stress reduction, um, you know, just improving yourself, sort of doing better, feeling better. Nicholas, one yeah. quick question for clarifying uh, one of the data points you mentioned. Uh, on the percentage of Americans meditating uh, from the CDC, was, was that uh, a, a, like a daily practice or just in in some way over the last year? Or um, to, I can't quite remember what the question was. I don't know how specific they were. So this was mixed in with a whole bunch of questions about alternative health practices, um, including chiropractic. Now, why meditation and chiropractic are in the same area, I don't really understand. Um, but I, I can't recall. I, I have to get back to you or, or whomever asked that question about whether it was in what was sort of. In, I suspect it was more towards the latter, at least from my recollection. But I'd have to look at the specifics in, in the sense that it's more likely to be have just engaged in meditation in general as opposed to are engaged in a regular practice. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with that as being the likely uh, thing, just because it, it's so uh, such a small percentage of people who, who start meditating that really maintain it in some daily manner. Yeah, and look, that's I'll, I'll present some more data um, as, as I go here about sort of in particular what we tend to know about attrition rates and things like that, especially in the real world as it pertains to meditation apps, which I think is, is, an, is further informative of kind of who continues to do it after they start it. Um, okay, um, so I mean, look, a whole other really interesting question. What do meditators actually do? I mean, look, at the end of the day, we may never actually know because we don't really know whether people are telling us what they do when they practice. Um, I, this is a huge challenge for us meditation researchers. We instruct people to um, do particular things, and we really hope that's what they're doing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they could be doing all kinds of other things while they're telling us they're meditating. Um, they could be 
composing their email to their boss or you know creating shopping lists. Um, but what, what do people say they're doing? So um, the most common practice, and this is a study by, um, again, Peter, Peter Settlemeyer with Karen Motko, a, a former PhD student. The most common things were scanning the body, um, looking at the breath, particularly at the abdomen, and observing thoughts arise in the mind um, with an effort not to adhere to them. So really, I mean, the kind of definitions and the way that mindfulness-based stress reduction talks about teaching people to practice body scan, um, awareness of breath, and sort of exploration of thoughts, those are the most common across the board. Um, these meditators that, that were surveyed here um, had on average 15 years of practice. There's a lot of variance, um, but it, in a, they were practicing across multiple traditions. So Buddhist, um, Hindu, and multiple other ideas. So interestingly, what most people seem, or at least are saying they're doing in meditation is reasonably uniform, or at least a lot of people are doing kind of the basics. But as you start to kind of go down the list here, you can see that things like singing sutras and mantras um, <clears throat> or, you know, other things like trying to go into a state of deep relaxation um, or, you know, maybe even something like lucid dreaming or, you know, you can see cultivation, you know, sympathetic joy, equanimity, loving kindness. Um, these are things that people are doing as well. So, you know, while the most common things are things that maybe give us some hope that we're studying similar things if we study quote unquote meditation um it, it's worth noting that there's a lot of heterogeneity in what people do kind of in their regular practice and i just put this up here so um sorry the the, the image got a little bit blurred um but just to give you a sense so they, the uh Matko, karen Matko did a um a, an analysis of you know of kind of the different practices and techniques that people claim they use and you know, this is just to demonstrate the, the wide variety and heterogeneity of practices that are out there that people seem to engage in on a regular basis. So there's really just an incredibly broad array of ways in which people use practices from various different traditions. And so if you're doing research on meditation, it's incredibly important to try to pin this down. Um, because if you ask people, in, you know, who say they meditate, um, how they're feeling, you know, people could be visualizing a deity or they could be focusing on their breath or any variety of other things. And it's really hard to conclude that there's benefits to, to the particular meditation practice they're doing, let's call it mindfulness, when, you know, you don't really know what it is that they're engaging in. Um, and so this is a particular thing I've seen happen in a lot of meditation research is they just recruit meditators. Um, and, you know, meditation can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. All right, so um, a PhD student of mine, Nick Bowles, who you can see in the upper right here, has recently been trying to sort of explore some of this um, in more detail. So um, I believe we started this last year. So we, we collected a sample of um, regular meditators or people sort of at least who were either had it developed or were planning to develop a regular meditation practice. And we wanted to know a number of things about them. Um, and, and after we enrolled them, we also followed them prospectively to try to get some sense of, and I, I don't have that data yet to present to you, but I'm gonna show you some things about what we found out in terms of what these people were doing and how they were doing it. And I think it's quite helpful in the sense that it, 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 it helps to sort of give us some sense of, you know, across a wide sample of meditators, what is it that they're actually doing and how are they doing it? So you can see here in terms of who these people are um, that we've got a bit of a bimodal distribution. So we've got, um, you know, quite a few people here on the really high end of practice, and we've got quite a few people here on the really low end of practice, but we've got some nice representation in the middle. So this figure on the left here is showing um, the distribution for the overall number of years of practice. And then you can sort of look at another um, uh, figure on the right here showing overall estimated hours. And that sort of figure actually is a little bit more evenly distributed. Um, so, so we're looking at quite a wide variety of people in terms of their practice. Now, when we asked them kind of what they did, um, similar to what we saw previously, the most common thing was focusing on their breath. Um, so again, similar to what you saw in the work by um, Settlemeyer and colleagues, that is by far the most common practice. But, um, you know, not far behind it is cultivating practice. Um, other practices, um, you know, are there with reasonable frequency, but, um, you know, if you think about sort of the numbers and start doing the math, um, the, the absolute numbers of people we're representing in these categories is not huge. Um, but you know, the other common things we saw are people doing yoga, um, doing open monitoring or open awareness, walking meditation, um, non-duality, visualization, kind of sound meditation, mantra, vipassana, um, and goenka. Um, so th there was a wide representation and variety, but I think the main takeaway here is that focusing on the breath is the most common thing. Um, 
the the biggest faith traditions or or, or kind of um, tradition within people are practicing does tend to be Buddhism, um, but you know secular um, or sort of no orientation was the next one on the list, um, as was no faith or tradition. So you can see sort of you know something on the order of I guess I don't know uh, it's in the mid 30s percent wise. Um, so most people, at least the ones that we surveyed here, are either practicing sort of in a Buddhist or a, a secular no faith tradition. We did, however, sort of manage to sample some people. Um, from a number of other different faith or spiritual traditions. Uh, Nick, um, there's one question on that. Uh, of course, depending on how you obtain a sample like this, you would get different numbers, right? And um, so I'm, I just wanted to refresh. I don't know if you mentioned it, but was this a, an e a, a web uh, kind of advertisement for people on a particular social media or something? How, how did you spread the word to collect the people who you surveyed in this way? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and so I should add to the, the link. To, so this is currently under review. Um, it's a preprint. Um, there may be people um, who are reviewing this uh, watching today. Um, if so, you know, I'll make a sacrifice in your name. Um, <laughs> but uh, so in terms of what we did here, um, we this was online surveys. We actively promoted this through um, a wide variety of channels. So, I mean, we went out to meditation centers, um, both Buddhist, secular, and other. Um, we did do some Facebook advertising as well to try and get a, a, a larger, more representative sample. Um, I don't have the data here on the slides, but the in terms of, I guess, thinking about our targeted advertising, where we sort of just tried to get broad groups of meditators, um, we didn't see massive differences um, in terms of the Facebook targeted advertising and um, the, the people that we collected via convenient sampling or snowball sampling from, from other traditions. Um, so we do have reasonably good confidence that um, this is sort of generally reasonably representative. Of course, this is all convenience, you know, um, these are all opt-in people, so there's likely to be some bias in, in, in who's agreeing to sign up to the study. And, uh, and more representative of Australia in particular? Yes, yeah, so the, um, the, 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 um, the composition of the sample is largely Australian, but there's quite a lot of people from the US and the UK in the sample as well. Got it. Um, so what are people using in terms of their practice? And again, sort of keeping in mind, you know, what, what um, we just discussed, you know, that this is, um, th there is a particular sample. I mean, it's, it's um, disproportionately Australian, but there's quite a lot of people from the US and the UK as well. Um, but what are people using? How are they supporting their practice? Um, so 68% of people are using some kind of online content, videos, um, guided programs, et cetera. 54% of these individuals are using apps. Um, now, we were quite surprised by that, I guess, for a number of reasons. We thought it might be higher. Um, we also, I guess, simultaneously thought it might be lower. Um, so particularly given that there were a lot of quite experienced meditators, um, it was quite interesting for us to note that there was still a, a fairly high proportion of people using apps, and certainly there were more people using apps than weren't. Um, so I guess that, that's a particular trend that is happening, not just in general, but um, you know, also across experienced meditating samples as well. Um, now, I can't off the top of my head recall um, if we looked at sort of any split analysis where we looked at whether or not ratios were different between experienced meditators or not. Um, I imagine people might like to know that, um, and so that is something that I will go back and try to dig up. Um, People, another very common thing was to just read books. So getting, you know, Dharma based books or meditation instruction books um, and then sort of going down, you can see that the, the less common things were practicing with others or working with a teacher. So only 18 percent of people were actually working with a teacher. So I guess it's quite interesting to note that the way that most of us, I guess, or most people sort of that are firmly embedded in meditation research or training, which typically suggests is the best way to learn, that is kind of working in a group or, um, you know, doing things directly with the teacher um, is not as common as things like doing things online or doing things via an app. Um, now, I'm trying to remember, we did start this um, during the pandemic. Um, so we did, these are actually differentiated and, and that there's a reason why it says contact with teacher. Um, we did try to make sure sort of that it was not necessarily, we weren't sort of necessarily restricting it to face-to-face -face contact. Um, but you know, given that this is in COVID, um, it is possible that sort of the online and app element is, is, is higher than it might've been pre-pandemic. Um, 
interesting note. So what is it that people really wanted to get out of it? Most common things were mental health and well-being. Um, so most people, and what we did, what we did is we just we gave people these different areas. So we have um, six different, no, five different areas, um, and we basically just asked them to rate how important these areas were to them in terms of their motivations or their goals for their practice. And most people suggested that mental health and well-being were a particularly important or big motivating factor in terms of them um, engaging with meditation. Um, things like improving relationships and physical health or performance enhancement were reasonably high, but kind of lower down the list. Um, and spiritual growth um, was reasonably high, but again, lower down the list. Um, now, I can't remember if I added something, no. Um, one, one interesting point to note, um, we didn't see a whole lot of patterns here with respect to um, goals for practice and duration of practice. But one thing we did note, which I unfortunately didn't include um, on this slide, is that people with longer practice length, so people that have been practicing for longer, it's a better way of saying it, um, were more interested in spiritual growth. So this idea sort of that goals change over time seems to hold up, at least in this sort of cross-sectional survey. Um, so in this case, you know, it seems like the people that had been practicing for longer were more interested in spiritual growth than the people that hadn't been practicing as long. Now, of course, there's self-selection bias, and it very well could have been that, you know, the people that we were looking at with longer um, hours of practice or had been practicing for longer, you know, were only continuing to practice because, um, things were going well, and it very well could have been that they had always been interested in spiritual growth. Um, so it's very hard to say, you know, when you're looking at people who have been doing practice for 30 years um, with this style of research, whether that was their motivation from the beginning. Um, and for that reason, we've been starting to think about it. And this um, study in particular also has a prospective longitudinal element, because without some longitudinal research, it's really hard to know whether these motivating factors are the same at the beginning as in the end. Um, now, obviously, we can't follow people for 30 years, as cool as that would be. Um, you know, that would take quite the gargantuan, um, probably collaborative effort internationally. If anyone's game, let me know. Um, and if anyone has anyone that is prepared to shell out the amount of money that that probably would require, I'm very willing to do it. Um, but yeah, it would take some significant dedication and time. Now, one thing that we found in, in our analysis of data, so we looked at a number of things, and I think the thing that really stands out for me in terms of this data is when we looked at associations between amount of practice and our kind of outcome measures. So we included things like psychological distress, so we used the K10, um, and we included measures of positive and negative affect, which allowed us to um, calculate something called affective balance, and we looked at satisfaction with life. So these are all just sort of basic indicators of um, you know, psychological health and well-being. And we did linear regressions, and we found linear relationships. But when we fit generalized additive models, we found that in almost all cases, with the exception of negative affect, which I'm not showing here, the, the generalized additive model, which allows for the relationship to be nonlinear, fit the, um, the data substantially better. So the, the, the nonlinear models were a significant improvement in terms of fitting the data. Um, and that's really interesting because it suggests that the, the, the gains or the way in which people experience growth um, in relationship to their meditation practice may be nonlinear. Um, and particularly interesting as well of note here, as you can see, the, the, the slopes in all of these lines are steeper earlier in the practice. And that's what these little inserts are showing you. Um, that the, the people seem to be showing more pronounced gains earlier on in their practice. Now, we thought a lot about why this might be, and obviously we need to do more work to figure out whether or not our kind of pet hypothesis it, it holds any water. Um, but our suspicion is that, or our hypothesis is that, it may actually just have to do with our measures. Um, so people tend to notice kind of these big changes, particularly sort of in mental health and well-being earlier on in practice. Um, as people progress in their practice, um, people tend to talk about much more subtle things changing. Um, and our broad kind of measures of things like well-being and psychological distress are probably not very good at picking up kind of the subtle nuanced details that we may be observing after, you know, 4,000, 5,000 hours of practice. Um, so thinking back to like the, um, the, the paper that, um, that, that Slaughter did with Richie Davidson in 2007, looking at the attentional blink, um, experienced meditators showed a um, 
a significant improvement sort of in picking up a second stimulus that was presented rapidly in time. Um, so that's something that for a lot of people, they just cannot do it, it's re or it's really hard to do. Um, but experienced meditators were better able to detect this kind of stimulus that they probably shouldn't have been able to do. Similarly, you sort of have these case studies with um, work by Paul Ekman, for example, you know, where um, you see somebody shooting a gun um, next to, I mean, it may have been Mathieu Ricard, actually, I can't quite recall, um, Rael might know, um, but you see this sort of attenuated startle response. Um, and so it may very well be that the types of changes that are going on later on as people have really developed their practices are much more subtle and that actually the questions we're asking may not necessarily be all that well suited to picking these things up. Now, another possible explanation could just be that most of the benefits of these things or the biggest benefits are happening earlier on. So that, that's an alternative explanation that people really um, are kind of really having the biggest impact when they start to practice. Um, it's possible that the things they're doing subsequently are maintenance. Um, we don't really know. Any clarifying questions about that? Okay, I'll keep going then. Um, I'll come back a little bit to talk about that idea of sort of some of the things that might be going on there and sort of particularly the, the elements of the, the dose response, because I think that's something that's really important as we start to think about um, how mindfulness and, and really now getting into the core of kind of what I wanted to talk about of scaling mindfulness. Um, really trying to understand how we make this available to more and more people, but do so in an effective way. And so what's important, and so here's some analysis showing um, different effects as a result of different methods. So what you're looking at here is just some bar graphs that I threw together. Um, on the left, it's just effect size. The different bars, um, and so the references for these are below. Um, so these are from meta-analyses of face-to-face mindfulness-based programs. So that's in these kind of um, teal bars here. Um, online mindfulness-based programs. So that is sort of more of the kind of limey green one in the middle. Um, and then apps um, in the kind of more blue color. So when you look at effect size across anxiety, depression, stress or distress, and well-being, it's kind of interesting to note that particularly in the domain of mental health, that face-to-face -face effects are much more pronounced than online or apps. Um, when you get to things like stress or well-being, the differences actually aren't as pronounced. Um, now, one reason might be sort of just bias in terms of reporting. It could be that, you know, apps or online programs work as well or comparably well for these bigger, broader issues, um, we don't really know. But, but I find it interesting sort of that, particularly for sort of mental health or pointier issues, it looks like the face-to-face -face stuff works better. Um, now, we're, we're desperately in need, I think, of a head-to-head -head study comparing face-to-face -face programs to a comparable program via an online thing or an app. I'm not aware of any, um, but maybe people are doing them as we speak. Maybe some of you are doing them as we speak. Um, another interesting thing to note is attrition rates. Now, keep in mind that these are all um, analyses of RCTs, so these are in pretty good conditions. Um, so this is data, whoops, um, I'm showing data from, um, from analyses of RCTs, uh, and this is data that I don't think is out in the world yet, but which I've had the privilege to see from Simon Goldberg and Richie Davidson. Um, on average, it seems like attrition rates across randomized control trials of mindfulness-based practices is on the order of 20% which is a little bit better than kind of the, 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 the number that I typically get quoted, which is around 30%. Um, when we look at the online programs, we're closer to 30, and when we look at apps, we're closer to sort of in the mid 30s. Um, now this sort of contrasts with a lot of people's experiences with apps, but as I said, keep in mind that um, these are in randomized controlled trials. Um, there is a lot of, I didn't put, I should have put error bars on here. Um, there is a lot of variance, um, and particularly as you go to the online and the app kind of context, there's a, a lot of variance. Um, the variance seems to be smaller within face-to-face -face programs. So, I mean, what that says sort of is even though, you know, the effects are potentially comparable for broader things like well-being and stress, you have to keep in mind that fewer people are sticking with it when you're shifting things to online or you're doing these things via apps than if you're doing them face-to-face -face or in the traditional structured way. Um, now, talking a little bit about apps, um, there is a lot of interest in these things, and there's also a lot of money. So these are just estimates from Sensor Tower, but it's worth noting that, so as you start to talk about some of the most popular apps, like Calm and Headspace, the number of people, this is literally just January of this year, just one month, 
Um, Two million people downloaded Calm, and their estimated revenue in relationship to that was $10 million U.S. Um, so Calm is worth well over a billion dollars. Um, and, you know, in a given month, at, at the first month of the year, they brought in $10 million. Um, Headspace didn't have quite so many downloads, but they brought in um, $5 million. Um, as you start to look in sort of some you know, crowd favorites among particularly meditation people, things like 10% happier and waking up, not necessarily achieving comparable numbers of downloads, but the revenue is still pretty big. Um, so there's a lot of money in this and there's a lot of interest in this. And we probably don't know anywhere near as much as we would like to about these things. Um, so um, as I mentioned, you know, the apps are becoming ever more prevalent and ever more common. Um, it, it's kind of interesting to note kind of the claims that and, and the degree of marketing that these apps are using and kind of how they're promoting themselves. Um, and so you, you, particularly with Headspace and Calm, the, the more popular ones, you're seeing these kinds of increasingly things of like, you know, bringing on people like Matthew McConaughey or John Legend. You know, you're getting the bedtime stories. You're getting sort of celebrity sort of guided practices. Um, and so, look, it's worth noting that sort of the content that's being put on these apps is not necessarily guided structured meditation in a traditional context, but some of it really is probably there just to increase the broad appeal. Um, it's worth noting that this is, as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's well over, the, the industry is worth well over a billion dollars. Calm itself is valued at over a billion dollars. It's also worth noting, um, there was just an announcement not that long ago that Calm actually received NIH funding. Um, this is particularly interesting to note that a company that's worth over a billion dollars got in the U.S. federal taxpayer money to do a study. Now, I haven't dug into it too much. I don't know all that much about the study. I know that it's something to do with adopting an app for cancer. Um, but one could raise the question, does a company that's worth over a billion dollars really need NIH funding? All right. Now, what do we actually know about kind of app use or um, uh, uh, sort of data in the wild? This is just an estimate, um, but, uh, you know, it sort of seems to track when, when I've talked to people um, in the meditation app industry, um, although they won't go on the record and although they sort of seem very reluctant to actually release their data, they could um, correct this if it was inaccurate. Um, this seems to track. So what we know is that there are a lot of downloads, um, but all, not all of that much use over time. So it's, this is quite interesting. These are estimates that Amit Bommel um, did using Sensor Tower in 2019. Um, and you can see sort of that, you know, seven, 60 to 70 percent of people who download mental health and meditation apps never even open them. Um, so, you know, you're already losing 30 to 40 percent of people that they're just they're downloading them, but they're not even opening them um, seven days out. Um, you're on the order of 10%. So you've lost 90% of people. By one month, you're lucky if you have 5% of people. So real life data seems to suggest that in terms of apps, and, and you'll see this among a lot of the app companies, they love to promote downloads, but they don't necessarily talk to you about their active, use, active user bases. Now, some apps do, um, but, but they sort of seem to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, now, as we think about that, that's quite important because we're starting to get into the meat of this dose response. How much practice do you need to do and for how long? Um, Willoughby Britain has introduced this idea of, well, maybe there is an optimal dose. You know, maybe if you don't do enough, you don't actually see any benefits. Maybe if you do too much, you actually start to see harms. And there's probably a sweet spot in the middle, or at least that's what Willoughby has, has postulated. Um, now, Going into that, we do know um, increasingly as a result of work being done probably, I think, only really in the past five years that adverse events um, do occur. And um, a recent estimate from Miguel Farias um, in, in a, um, a meta-analysis has discovered that sort of adverse events seem to occur at a rate of about 8.3%. By far, the most common forms of adverse events are depression and anxiety, but things like suicidal behaviors, dissociation, and depersonalization, these things do occur. Um, so, you know, on the order of 8%, that's not substantially higher than what we see in psychotherapy. Um, but, you know, I think the average there sort of is similar, 5%, 6%. Um, but these things are not without potential harms. Um, this is not necessarily looking at apps, although there are anecdotal um, tales sort of of apps in particular sort of leading to adverse events as well. I don't know that anyone has done a systematic review or analysis of that yet, um, but there is some evidence to suggest that people may also be experiencing some of these um, adverse events with apps. Um, 
but how much practice should you actually do? And the reason that I raised this question with apps is, or started to go in the direction of talking about apps is that, you know, there is this tendency among apps to suggest that you only need a few minutes. Um, so my student Nick Bowles also has started to look at, not, and we're not doing a systematic review, but we've just sort of tried to look at what do different teachers recommend. Um, and so one of the things that we found is when you look at Buddhist teachers in particular, for novices, they're recommending on average thereabouts of 20 minutes per day. Um, and they're recommending that you should practice roughly daily. Um, when you start to look at more popular secular teachers, they're recommending around about 12 minutes per day. When you look at apps, they're recommending about 10 minutes a day. And this is for people that are just getting started. So there is this trend towards less and less and less meditation. And that's true also when you talk about the upper end. So when you look at Buddhist teachers, you know, kind of ballpark, median, you know, they're recommending about 45 minutes to over an hour. When you go to sort of popular secular teachers, 30 to 45 minutes. And when you get to meditation apps, they're recommending on order of 20 minutes for people with more experience. So although it would seem like meditation apps in particular would be a great opportunity to sort of explore dose response context, um, there probably aren't a whole lot of people using apps that are necessarily at that extreme end, unless you're looking at things over time, potentially. Um, and this is from um, Sarah Stromair, so looking at whether or not practice actually does matter. So I think there is this important question of how much does the amount of practice you do matter? And you can see sort of that there is a, a small relationship, quite small here, um, in terms of um, use of, of a given program. Um, so these are mindfulness-based programs, um, to my knowledge, in hours and the relationship to the effect size. And there's a very small relationship. Um, now, one question, and Sarah, I see, is on here, so she can answer questions about this in particular if people have them, um, that one thing that I think that is really worth noting in this context is that um, it may be in the context of things like mindfulness-based stress reduction that there is a critical mass or a critical number of hours, and it may be that people already get that in the context of programs. So I think individual variation um, in things like MVPs is really hard to look at. I don't, I'm not 100% convinced that MVPs is really, are, are really all that well suited to, to looking at this dose response question, just because you've already got practice in the context of the groups and you've got practice in the context of interacting with the teacher. Um, so it's a little bit of a challenge, I think, in that context to look at, say, home practice over and above the group practice or the teacher-led practice, um, because it, it may very well be that, you know, there is that critical amount that's already being achieved. Um, but anyway, we, I guess the, the bigger point is that we just don't have the evidence at this point that dose really matters, but arguably I'd also say we probably haven't designed or had enough studies that have been done explicitly to look at this. Um, now this is a bit of a proposal um, or, or a way sort of to start thinking about dose response in my mind, and something that um, I haven't written anything about, I've only just started to think about. But, but it might be useful for us to think about the kind of dose response approach the way that it's thought about in pharmacology in mental health um, with respect to meditation because it might help us to get a framework or, or get something to work with in terms of what are we seeing and so this is um, this is particularly looking at um, to, to, to memory um, antidepressant use in the context of depression and so what you can see here and this is um, uh, the references down here it's a recreated figure from work done by I believe Pim Kuypers and so you can see there's sort of there's this concept here of progression to the disorder um, so people start off, you know, quote unquote, being normal or with no symptoms. They then develop some symptoms. At some point, they, they pass the threshold and develop the syndrome. Um, and then there is a period of acute treatment. Um, and then, you know, that acute treatment sort of sees them reaching some level of normalcy. And then you get into these different phases that I think these could be really worthwhile in us exploring dose response and meditation to think about. So the acute phase versus continuation phases versus maintenance phases. And the thing that's worth pointing out here is that if continuation or maintenance doesn't happen, that's when you get things like relapse or recurrence. And there may be similar analogs in meditation, albeit potentially in the opposite direction, um, that we could be looking at. So just a quick cartoon of what that might look like. Um, and this is not even thinking about, this is thinking about sort of promotion of well-being as opposed to, or promotion of insight as opposed to thinking about management of mental health or distress. Um, but it's very possible that, you know, an acute phase, and this may really be that concentrated intensive practice, is what really creates some meaningful level of insight. Um, and then essentially you need ongoing regular practice on a, in your daily life to maintain gains. Um, and if you don't do that, 
you may still see some benefit and it may stay there, but there may be some slow, subtle, gradual return to baseline. And it may be that sort of if you want to go further, you want to go deeper into your practice, that you need additional concentrated practice to get further insight. And if you want to maintain that gain, that you need to continue regular daily practice or regular informal practice to see that. Now, this is literally just sort of speculation, hypothesis, but I think this framework could be really helpful as we start to think about the dose response effect um, in meditation, because we have lots of unanswered questions and we have lots of unanswered elements of this, which have to do with frequency, quality, regular uh, um, amount of practice, and also sort of, I guess, the question of kind of the depth of practice, you know, a retreat is not necessarily the same, you know, if you if you do um, 50 hours in a retreat, that's not necessarily the same as accruing 50 hours through daily practice of 20 minutes a day. Um, so it's important that we start to consider these things. Um, it's also important to think about the fact that different practices may have appeal or may benefit people with different goals. And so, you know, work by Tanya Singer with the research project has already started to give us some insights into this. It may be that practices that focus on things like the breath or the body are really helpful with things like attention or focus, but not so helpful in terms of cultivating um, compassion or sort of balancing affect. Um, you know, so, so it's important to, for us to acknowledge or think about that people have many different reasons to engage in meditation and what works for one individual and for, with one given goal may not necessarily be the same for another individual with a very different goal. It's also um, important to state that people's goals change over time. So what works for them early on in their practice may not be the thing that sort of ultimately helps them later on in their practice when that goal shifts. Sorry about that. All right, um, now finally, I think it's important to um, address this question of who can teach these practices. So as we start to think about the scaling of meditation, it's also important to consider this question. So because meditation is becoming more and more accessible and there's a greater and greater push to make this stuff available more widely online. Um, apologies again. I'm in my office for the first time in like two years. So um, things are a little bit um, unusual for me today. Um, so as we see more and more offerings of these and we see less and less involvement of a teacher, it's important to note that, um, you know, these requirements or sort of these um, considerations of who is actually doing the delivery are things that probably aren't happening as much. So we know in the context of mindfulness-based programs or mindfulness-based interventions um, that we have fairly stringent requirements, particularly when we're talking about things like MBSR and MBCT. Um, but as we start to get into the domain of apps or other spaces, um, these kind of same principles aren't there. And it's something that we really need to think about. Um, because when we talk about people who are kind of uh, approved or who are given the authority to teach meditation in the context of MBSR, you know, there's some basic ideas. They have to have undertaken the course themselves. They have to have a regular daily practice. They have to have attended a retreat. That's the bare minimum. Um, and then there's sort of assumptions that they've undergone teacher training and various other things. And I think this is particularly important as we start to think about the application of meditation or mindfulness to health, to education, to other areas where we're talking about, um, you know, requirements for empirical based standards. It may be a bit different as we start talking about spiritual progress, because how do you benchmark this stuff? Um, but I still think we should be thinking about it even in that space. So who is qualified to teach and what do those qualifications look like? That's something I think as a, as a, as a group of researchers, um, as an area, we need to have a lot more discussions about. All right, um, that is it for um, my formal presentation. I just noted that there was a question about the previous figure. Um, I'm not sure if it was pertaining to this study. Uh, that question about the N uh, that came up was um, when the study that you had done, you or your colleagues had done yourself before. Yeah, that, I think it was this one. The adverse uh, events? Yeah, well, no, I, so this was a meta after analysis. this one, after this one was, uh, yeah, Stromare. This was all, yeah, so Sarah's here. So she, this was also a meta analysis. Um, Sarah, I, what, it was like, what, 20 studies or something like that? Am I off? Oh, no, it was a lot more. Well, and Sarah's if, if, 
this was a meta-analysis. So Sarah Stormare is actually in the, in, if she's still here, um, otherwise I can, I can look it up later. Right, so there's, it's a very large N uh, across multiple studies um, with uh, different precise experimental conditions in each study. Yeah, so she said 203 studies, but different, different number of studies for different doses. Yeah, that's a lot of studies. Um, all right, well, thank you everyone for your attention and time. I keep clicking on this link, making me see Tanya Singer's thing. Again, here's my email, Twitter, um, link to the center. Um, yeah, happy to, to take questions. Well, thank you. Very interesting uh, uh, presentation and kind of overview of where our field is standing. Um, one of the... Um, the areas you touched on uh, that I'd just like to see if you uh, can go into a little bit more in depth. And it's partly, um, you know, just the juxtaposition of our last speaker was Amishi Ja, followed by your presentation today, um, wherein you, uh, you know, put up at, at the outset there of talking about well, what, are, what are we even speaking about when we talk about mindfulness and, you know, to what extent does the attentional state that uh, might be ideal for a sniper to be in overlap with what we mean when we uh, talk about mindfulness. And certainly if you look at John Kabat-Zinn's classic definition, um, there's a, a fair degree of overlap, which I think is what you were pointing to. Um, and if you look at uh, the traditional uh, Buddhist conceptualizations, one could say, well, that's a pretty low degree of overlap. <laughs> um, and, you know, as at, in the scientific enterprise, of course, we have to be attuned to, well, what can be quantified without reference to uh, value systems? And then if we do start looking at value systems, you know, in what way can those be studied scientifically? So I'm just interested for your thoughts about what would what would it look like to start incorporating something around ethics or value systems into uh, scientific studies of mindfulness? Um, so that's, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of discussion that's been happening around sort of are the program, I mean, the, there's a default assumption, I think, in medicine, right, that sort of what we do is value neutral. Um, that sort of, and, and this is, there's been a lot of discussion around this with respect to mindfulness-based stress reduction and other mindfulness-based programs. Are they value neutral? Um, and there's a lot of people that will say, yes, they are. You know, they're, they're, you, can, you, can, you can sort of use them in any context or with any set of values. Um, but many of the teachers and people sort of that are delivering MBSR, including John Kabat-Zinn, um, have suggested that, well, even though the values are not explicit, even though we're not necessarily always talking about those value systems, they're at least often implicit. Um, and it's worth noting, I think, that many, you know, one of the criteria that I mentioned with that last slide with Rebecca from Rebecca Crane, um, in terms of one of the, the things that you have to do if you want to be a meditation, an MBSR, a certified MBSR teacher, is, is go on a retreat. And many people do these retreats through places like Insight Meditation Society or Spirit Rock or, you know, particularly in the States, um, where often the guides are Buddhist teachers. Um, so, you know, is MBSR value neutral? I mean, it's a hot topic of debate. A lot of people would say, oh, of course it's value neutral. Um, my position at the end of the day, based on sort of what I've, my readings of John and other people, it's, I don't think it is. I don't think it is totally value neutral. Um, I think it can accommodate heterogeneity in values. Um, which is to say, I don't think it, it pushes a core set of ethics or principles on people, um, but there are certain values I think that it, it does encourage and instill. Um, now, in terms of research and like how we would look at this, I mean, I think we could be doing a lot more looking at how these practices influence people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I think that that might start to give us a way of looking at this question of how does it affect ethics and values. Um, so in other words, and I, I think this is also a potential solution to my mind of getting around trying to measure mindfulness, of trying to sort of p ask people to self-report on, you know, their own ability to pay attention or focus or experience these states, which I think is just inherently flawed. 
I think you know what we're asking people to do is just incredibly challenging. Um, but if you started to look, for example, on after someone has done a course or a program, what do they behave like in the world? Are they more charitable? Are they more altruistic? In the military, it'd be really interesting to know, um, you know, when it comes, say, to snipers or elite forces, are they more or less likely to pull the trigger? Do they have a harder time doing these things or an easier time? Um, I, I, like Amishi's work, for instance, I think a lot of the focus, particularly with the military, and I know this is true with her collaboration with Elizabeth Stanley, you know, a lot of it is focused on the soldiers themselves, you know, and ensuring sort of that or doing the best to kind of give them, uh, facilitate resilience and help them to sort of avoid developing PTSD and recover from kind of intense experiences. But I think to answer this question, to really look at sort of the value proposition, it would be very interesting to start to ask that question of what do they look like out in the battlefield? Or in corporate settings, where we're doing mindfulness-based training and workshops, what impact does that have on the way that corporate executives operate? You know, are they are they sort of starting to shift their priorities? Is it less about the bottom line and more about the well-being of the employees? So that, to my mind, I think that the research can be done. Um, I, I also think we could be asking people more explicitly about sort of the things that they value. Um, going into these programs and sort of and then looking again at whether or not those ideas have changed or shifted after the program. Um, yeah, so those are just some thoughts on that. I mean, w one other thing, likewise, I think one thing that Paul Grossman and I have talked about a lot, um, and this is in particular in, in relationship to the measures of mindfulness, is that I think it's very difficult to disentangle the extent to which people want to be mindful from the extent to which they may actually be mindful. And that is a value thing, right? So people, you know, you spend eight weeks doing MBSR, you paid maybe a thousand dollars to learn it. You probably hope that you're a little bit more mindful at the end of all of that. Um, and so, you know, that may be creating bias in the way that people perceive or understand what's happened to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the probably the closest um, study that I'm aware of that has aimed at looking at kind of real world consequences on values and ethics of mindfulness training is that study that's now about eight years old by uh, Paul Condon. You probably know this one where he assessed surreptitiously assessed people's kind of tendency to want to help uh, a, a person in need of a physical handicap who kind of walks into the experimental room, um, you know, assessing uh, people who either had gone through, randomized to go through the, the, the mindfulness, I think it was MBSR, um, versus those who hadn't been throwing an impact on um, kind of readiness to give up your seat for somebody who walks in with a, with a physical handicap into the room. Um, and, you know, that only kind of begins to open the door that it's kind of one of the things that's been assessed a lot, of course, and is much more a kind of self-centered metric is self-compassion, but it does begin to look at this kind of compassion oriented towards others, which is connected to uh, some of those deeper aspects of what the traditional goals of mindfulness practice were uh, really conceptualized as I'd say in the spiritual traditions, which have to do with kind of a realization of something that, uh, you know, scientifically may or may not be uh, kind of uh, fully supportable, but the, uh, the, the sense of the kind of uh, realization of the illusoriness of the separate self and the sense of kind of identification with uh, the, the collective and somehow being oriented more towards looking after the collective as if it is the self because of uh, some deeper realization about the nature of things. Um, so, you know, this, this study by Condon do, does kind of get at that a little bit, but it doesn't get at some of the more kind of fundamental reorganizations of ethical orientation about, you know, for example, to what extent are you mostly oriented in your life about your own personal pleasure and gain versus thinking more and kind of really motivated towards something for the collective good. Um, and is it the case that mindfulness practice has an impact on that when, when you don't start out with that orientation to it or not, I think is a, a, a difficult uh, question to, to answer. Mm 
I would I would agree, and I think that's you know part of the difficulty of this debate, right? Is if it if it is if it does. You know, if it does change that value system or it does change that value orientation, even if you didn't necessarily go in intending for it to, um, then that may not be the most ethical way of doing this, right? I mean, arguably, we should be obtaining informed consent. You know, so if we're actually shifting people's value systems, um, then we probably need to be making clear to people that the things that we're teaching them may very well change the way that they feel about their life and the people around them or their capacity to run their business successfully. Um, so it raises some very interesting sticking points. And I think that's one reason why the conversation maybe hasn't progressed as far as it probably should, um, because it's, it's a challenging one. So there's been a lot of focus on making mindfulness more available and more accessible and moving it into boardrooms and companies and things like that. When we start asking this question, um, that stalls some of that progression or those conversations because CEOs, you know, don't necessarily always want to talk about, you know, the extent to which, well, if a whole bunch of people are going to quit after I take them through an MBSR workshop, why would I be paying for it? You know, like, so, so, but I think it's something we ought to be talking about because arguably, you know, the goals of many of these practices are much broader and arguably the goals of the modern mindfulness movement are much broader. You know, there's a much, I think a lot of people have this bigger focus on broader societal change, on helping to manage things like climate change. And so we need to start looking at to what extent is that happening. Um, so we, I think we need to step outside the individual a bit. I'm not saying we don't look at the individual. We absolutely should. But we need to also look outside and around them. Yeah. We have a couple of other questions um, kind of related. Um, so Kiana Sabugo, uh, how important do you think it is to have in-depth personal experience in the practice of meditation in order to have a meaningful career? at the intersection of cognitive neuroscience and contemplative practice and are most scientists who study meditation heavy meditators themselves? I mean, I can only speak from my own experience um, and conversations I've had with people. Um, and it's a hard, that's a hard question and a good one. Um, I myself have really struggled with this question. Um, and for a very long time, I didn't want to progress my practice too far because I thought it could interfere with my ability to be objective in my scientific work. Um, so I don't really know. I mean, I think it's. In, I, I think I would say I think it's important to um, to maintain some sense of balance, to maintain some awareness of your blind spots. Um, I think you see similar analogs and sort of clinical research and clinical, you know, work, right, where, and particularly in sort of in mental health, where there's this fundamental question of, should you have undergone psychotherapy, or, you know, does it benefit you in your research, um, if you've been a patient type of thing, right? Do you know more about what it's like to be on the other side? Does having some insight into what it feels like to have a mental illness, make you better at kind of thinking about what questions ought to be asked and explored? in the context of psychotherapy. And so, you know, I guess in that vein, I would say, and I would agree that to some extent it does. Um, but I, I, I think the, it would be the same way I'd answer that question. You know, if a, a, a clinical psychology student came to me and said, should I undertake my own therapy? Uh, I'd probably say probably, it could probably be helpful. And I would say the same thing about meditation. Should you get more involved in meditation? It will probably be helpful for your meditation research. You'll probably get a lot of insights into things that can happen. But I think a really important thing to keep in mind in both of those contexts is that you shouldn't assume that because something happens for you or works for you, that it will be the same for everyone else. And I think that's where there's a real risk of bias. So in clinical work, for example, you know, I'd say to my students, just because a particular form of psychotherapy or a particular technique or treatment was really helpful for you in overcoming a particular problem doesn't mean that's going to work for all of your clients or your patients. And there can be a huge bias that's introduced there where you all of a sudden think, oh, this, uh, this, this client really reminds me of myself, therefore I ought to give them the thing that helped me. So you really have to be aware of your own biases. And I think it's the same in meditation, which is that the deeper you get into the practice, it gives you some interesting insights into things that you probably otherwise would not have had. And it gives you some really cool ideas about things to study. But you have to be aware that some of that may not be the whole story and it may be unique to you. Um, in terms of the other question, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, my experience would be in, in terms of chatting and interacting with people who study meditation, 
I mean, my general sense is a lot of them have engaged with meditation in some way, shape, or form. I know very few meditation researchers who have never done any meditation or have never dabbled in meditation. Um, but um, I think that the question, my sense at least, is that, you know, are they heavy meditators? I think it varies a lot. I think there are some people that are really committed, you know, kind of heavy, de you know, dedicated daily practitioners, some even that are dedicated, you know, Buddhists or Taoists or whatever. And there are others that just sort of dabble with it, you know, that have tried it, gone on retreats, that have done it, um, but aren't sort of quite so dedicated. So I think there's a lot of variability in that. And I, know, I do know some people who sort of have really done very little meditation um, and continue to research meditation. Yeah, I would say uh, just to add on to that last part from my experience, you know, knowing people in the field and my own experience is that also uh, in general that yes, there's 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 a range and it's very rare that somebody doesn't have at least some personal experience. Um, uh, but that your uh, kind of struggle with that question a little bit and, and sense of like, you know, um, the motivation to engage and continue with daily practice or, or regular practice somehow interfering with uh, research and or research interfering with your motivation that that is um, a not uncommon phenomenon. And I've, uh, I've struggled with it at times myself, um, sometimes even to the point of thinking like, I know I really want to deepen my practice and I don't think I can deepen it unless I just stop studying it so much. So. I, I, I'm not, I, mean, I, know, I know people um, you know, who have either quit research or quit meditation for those reasons, right? Who right. sort of have gone, well, either you know, they've had issues where they go, well, my results are not matching with my values or my beliefs. And for them, it was getting in the way of what was a very pleasant personal process. And so, you know, some of the people just went, I just can't study this anymore because it's interfering with my personal life. And I know yeah. other people have just gone, you know, look, um, it's just making it really hard for me to feel unbiased as a researcher. So I just can't do this anymore. So yeah, right. I, I think I, I suspect a lot of people, a lot more people that have come out and said it, find it to be quite a struggle. Yeah. But I think it's good that people are struggling with that because I think if we weren't, it would show that we sort of all kind of acquiesced in some ways to, to potential bias. The fact that they were aware of that, I feel like actually could be a good thing because I think it keeps us on our toes, so to speak, and we're watching out for potential sources of bias. Yeah, I'd say that's, it, it's, it's, a. Uh, it would be problematic if people weren't uh, struggling with that a bit. That's true. Um, so Ali Golam Reza uh, asks, there are a lot of components in the mindfulness practice, breathing, attention, etc. Recent evidence also showed the large effect of expectancy. How can we disentangle the specific aspect effects of mindfulness? Trials in the field were largely limited by not using appropriate control conditions. Sam, active control, don't we need more qualified research? So, you know, I think there's some, some important questions, some of which have been really addressed in the field, but you know, just uh, those combination of, you know, the disentangling the, or dismantling, uh, as you know, there's some people who've been tackling that and then, and then that issue around control conditions. Yeah, so Will Willoughby Bitten's group in particular, I know, has done some dismantling um, of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, so that the people, and I don't, I want to say Sonan Kamijian, although maybe that was just in her prior life, you know, when she was working in cognitive behavioral therapy research more. So the pe there are people out there that have done dismantling. David um, Cresswell uh, and colleagues okay. actually have done a few studies r recently as well, kind of specifically the explicit in inclusion versus exclusion of the self-acceptance instruction during the course of mindfulness training. Interesting. Yeah, and I guess arguably the resource project sort of also has this element of sort of looking right. at how different components of different types of practice may build on each other or change each other over time or what the yeah. impact of the individual things alone. So there are a number of people that are starting to do this. I guess dismantling is hard though. Like you know, there's so many things going on in mindfulness-based practices. Um, and so uh, to me, I feel like there's always the risk that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, like th there's always the risk that we go, oh, well, um, the thing that produced the most pronounced effect was this. You know, let's just say it's focus on the breath or the body scan. And therefore, we should be encouraging everybody to do the body scan. Um, so I, and, and I, I come at this again from a very clinical perspective and, and thinking about Sona Dimidjian, you know, some of her early work looking at dismantling cognitive behavioral therapy, 
suggested that behavioral activation or the behavioral element may be more important than the cognitive part for depression, as an example. Um, and I always struggle with that clinically because, I mean, arguably, my experience has been the behavioral part is probably really important early on in treatment for a lot of people. But my experience is also that the cognitive thing is something that people often pick up on and it's really important later on in therapy. So I think it, this is really challenging because you don't really know when individuals and, you know, most of these studies are working on averages, you know, that's how most of our statistics work. I mean, we're getting some new methods that are looking at sort of individual based meta analyses and individual based statistics. But most of our analyses sort of are just looking at averages. And so I think what you start to lose then is the individual. And it, it likely is that different individuals are going to respond to different things, period, but also respond to different things at different times. And so it, it's a real challenge to know then, well, if we start to pull this thing apart, do we lose things that really matter for people? Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't explore it. But I think it, 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 there's some risks and it has to be done carefully. And look, there is a lot going on in mindfulness-based programs. Um, and I, I think, you know, that's something that, to my knowledge, nobody in the field really agrees what the active ingredients are. There's just so many. Um, and so it's really hard to know kind of how, and look, the, the psychotherapy debate has been going on for ages, right? I mean, so as to what is the most important element of psychotherapy. So, I mean, I don't think that at any point soon we're going to agree on what's the active element in these mindfulness-based programs. Um, the, the question about controls, I mean, I think we're getting better at that as well. Um, we're seeing a lot more um, you know, active comparator groups, I think, that are much more comparable, that are much more rigorous, but it's something we have to keep working at. Um, I think shams are hard. It's hard to come up with a sham. Um, it's hard to come up with active control conditions. And you know, I think, I mean, a great example is the, the health enhancement program that Richie Davidson's group came up with as a comparator to MBSR. But an issue with that is, and again, sort of pull, you know, pull, pull, pulling on my knowledge of, from clinical psychology, you know, sometimes you develop a sham so well um, that the sham ends up being an effective intervention. Um, and the question then is, well, what have you shown? Um, you know, so I, and that may have been the case with the health enhancement program. Maybe they've shown that actually getting those core elements of you know promoting health and well-being is actually quite beneficial for a lot of people. Um, does that tell us that mindfulness is pointless or worthless? I don't think so. I think what it tells us sort of is that, you know, having kind of all the health promotion stuff versus having the health promotion stuff with the mindfulness stuff, you can't arguably say one is better based on the outcomes that we're looking at. So the mindfulness arguably doesn't, for that particular, those particular outcomes that they've looked at, it doesn't do more. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other questions, and I alluded to some of these, like, will people continue to do the practices? You know, so it may be in the 12 weeks or whatever, the eight weeks that we look at the study, they look the same. But what about at five years? You know, if people, and this is something I've talked about previously, I think if people continue to do mindfulness, then arguably it's the better treatment. If they work the same at eight weeks, and if they look the same at three, three months, then you, you know one thing. But if you're starting to look at five years, and you go, people are still doing MBSR, and they've long since stopped the health enhancement program, well, that's a different sort of answer. That shows you that actually, you know, the active, original active was, was in some way much better than the control. But we just, I don't think we know that yet. And so we need more of that kind of work. Um, similarly, I think we're getting better sort of at, you know, in, in neuroscience work of getting better controls. It's still a huge challenge, I think, there, though. Like, you know, I've often sort of joked about, like, who, do you, who is the control comparison person for Mathieu Ricard? You know, who is the other, I don't know how old he is now, what, in his 80s or 90s? You know, who is the other 80-year-old person who has a PhD in molecular biology, who has a famous father and mother, you know, who trained under a Nobel laureate, who knows His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, who's been meditating actively for 50 years, is a monk? Um, I have no idea. Um, so, that, so that's a challenge. One thing I think could be done, and one thing that I would love to see would be comparison of different monastics monks and nuns. Take different monks and nuns from different traditions. You can control for the lifestyle. You can go, okay, let's take some Christian monks and nuns who we know meditate. Let's take some Buddhist monks and nuns. Let's get a bunch of different monastics and let's see whether or not we can control for the lifestyle element. And let's find out whether or not the beliefs and the practices actually seem to make a difference. I think that would be really cool. Yeah.
I think um, just to elaborate a little bit on, on, on that answer is just that, you know, with this uh, development of very active control uh, conditions uh, like the health enhancement program and similar kind of takeoffs that other groups have implemented over the last five, 10 years, um, it is the case that as you were kind of pointing to, you know, some of the clinical metrics that have been looked at like anxiety and depression, for example, um, are showing a tendency in those studies where these very active control programs are implemented as the comparator towards, um, yeah, you know, the, although sometimes there are interesting differences on something like a brain measure or a immuno, immunologic measure, but the overall clinical effect uh, seems to be about the same between them. And that is kind of a, a take home message that I think the field has started to integrate and wrestle with a little bit like, okay, um, the, the, these mindfulness programs do not outperform a really, you know, tightly controlled comparator where there's a great emphasis on improving well-being, but with no mindfulness in, included. Um, so, and and then what you said, I think it's it's absolutely true that the, that the most of those studies have not done these long-term follow-ups. So, so, for example, we know that uh, the the short-term, uh, you know eight weeks to three months effect on major depressive disorder, for example, seems to be not so different, but what's happening long-term, we don't yet know. Um, yeah. And um, it's really been a, a pleasure uh, getting through these. I think we have time for one last question, um, which is again from Kiana. Um, Meditation as compared to other areas of studies in, co in co psychology is unique given the focus on subjective experiencing while engaging in the practice. With that in mind, neuro and other psychological measures are obviously more dependable sources of data than self-report. Are trends in meditation research going with the rest of the field of psych towards more rigorous quantitative measures or continuing to integrate self-report? I can speak about this as well, but I'd be interested yeah, in your thoughts on that. Question. Um, I mean, I don't, I, my general sense, I don't know that that meditation is all that unique. I think, I think there, I mean, I, maybe in some ways meditation, particularly in psych and neuro, neuroscience, I think maybe, maybe to some extent meditation has pushed the field a bit. Um, so I think that is a benefit that there's been a shift toward valuing the subjective more. Um, and thinking that the, the subjective matters. Um, you know, I think in psychiatry, um, there's, you know, there's still a lot of pushback on that and thinking sort of that, you know, look, obviously at the end of the day, the subjective is the subjective, you know, we can't verify it. Um, but it, it is really important. And I think that's something that's become more and more recognized, uh, you know, widely. Um, so- But the NIH yeah. is kind of, person-centered research initiative, you know, in a way there's a really explicit uh, transition over the last 10 years or so uh, in terms of, you know, biomedical research generally towards a more of an explicit incorporation of uh, subjective experience. Um, and it's still the case that there's this real struggle when you start to, you know, engage in a study with meditators, you know, to what extent are they saying what they think they should be saying, or what their, you know, ideal self uh, is versus, you know, something that is really a, a, a kind of um, a dependable uh, uh, kind of phenomenon. <laughs> um, and and of course, course I mean, there's, there's been cool efforts i guess to try to address some of those things you know and like there's ways of sort of say using natural language processing to try to tease out whether they're parroting kind of or echoing what somebody you know their teacher says um there's been increasingly a lot of use of ecological momentary assessment that i think is a, a really cool way to start to get a sense of what do these things look like in day-to-day -day life um and then kind of looking at a relationship to brain markers and self-report so you know as new challenges get thrown at us, I think the field is doing a pretty good job of actually kind of coming up with clever new ways of tackling them. Yeah. And I think you're right, you know, the, the shift from the funding agencies and things like that to really go, well, this really matters, I think is, is it's kind of running alongside this idea in meditation that, well, we need to be knowing what people are experiencing, both from the inside and from the outside. Right. And I'd say, you know, the, the in the big picture of like looking at the landscape of neuroscientific investigations of meditation, 
in the last few years, there's actually been more and more studies that are incorporating some more explicit neurophenomenologic attempt um, in, in that they're really trying to tie uh, the participant's subjective experience to some neural measure. You know, it's, it's kind of like the, the enterprise that was conceptualized by Francisco Varela early on in this dialogue between the contemplative traditions and, and neuroscience. Um, that for many years, you know, there were just very few studies that even attempted it in any explicit manner. And now in the last five years, you see more and more studies that are coming out. Um, and it, it's going to be tough to, to, to triangulate, but to, if you can end up finding, you know, strong correlations between the subjective and the objective measure, then we can start to have a, a better sense. The only issue is, that it may be the case that people's brains are unique enough that one person's you know, subjective experience involves their brain changing in one way and another person's really similar subjective experience involves their brain changing in a different way. Um, so that's just a, you know, one of the challenges that the field is trying to, to tackle, I'd say. Um, again, Nicholas, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and speaking with us today. Um, just for everyone else's uh, kind of reminder about some of our upcoming events, Zindel Siegel will be speaking um, for our group in a month on March 23rd. Sona Demijin, who uh, Nicholas was mentioning earlier, is speaking a few weeks after that on April 13th. Those will both be uh, 12 p.m. Um, uh, talks. And then we also have the Mobilizing Mindfulness Research Workshop led by Dr. Randy Semple and Matthew Goodman starting on March 22. You can sign up for that on our website and a call for proposals uh, for some pilot funding, which uh, is now due on April 18th. Again, if you go to mindfulscience.usc.edu, you can see more about all that. So thanks again for being with us today. Um, uh, please feel free to uh, follow up with me if you'd like to get in touch with uh, Nicholas and forgot his email contact and um, be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.